you. Well, not much to live up to then. Thanks for that. Um, okay, great. So my name is Sally Late. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's really, really lovely to be here. Uh, start off, quick check. After that, fantastic talk from Bruce. Who here cares about semantic HTML performance, accessibility? Put your hand up. Excellent. Because uh, I am here, luckily, uh, to speak to you about helping people care about standards. So great job. I can actually go. Thank you very much. You've saved us all half an hour. Um, but in all seriousness, the reality is that we are all here because we already care about this stuff, right? You're here on a Saturday. Um, and this year, it's all about fundamentals. So you're going to be hearing from, you know, you've heard from Bruce. You're going to hear from some other smart people today um, who are all going to be really kindly sharing their knowledge. And I imagine that all of you are going to be nodding along because you're already bought into these concepts, right? Um, even if you don't know the specifics, um, you, you care enough to be here in the first place. So I'm here today to talk a little bit about um, what happens when we leave this happy little conference bubble. Um, so we're going to go back to our offices next week, and we're going to be faced with the reality of budgets and deadlines and all the good things that we know and love. Um, so I want to run through these things in the next half an hour. So first of all, just going to recap a little bit. Bruce has set us up very, very well. Um, but we're going to cover why standards are important, going to think about what we're up against, um, and then we're going to come on to some practical examples with the takeaways. But before that, a uh, very quick intro. Um, as I've mentioned, my name is Sally. I work as an engineering manager at Monzo. Um, I'm the collective partner, um, collectors are sort of vertical segments, um, collective partner for COPS, which is our customer support aspect of the business, and I'm also the discipline lead for web. Um, you can find me on Twitter if you've got any questions. Uh, as has been mentioned, I have very, very poorly uh, managed my calendar, so I have to run away to one of my best friend's weddings. Uh, so do grab me very quickly afterwards if you've got any questions. Uh, but we can joke about how you know, everybody here already knows what standards are. Um, but actually making assumptions about these kind of things that everybody watching or you know, watching later on recorded videos um, that they're all bought into, that's quite a dangerous assumption to make. So really quickly, I'm just going to run through a couple of things in this front to set the scene a little bit better. So first up, what are standards? Uh, Bruce has done a really great job. Sorry that some stuff's overlapping because uh, of the screen. Um, but basically, this is the Wikipedia definition. And it talks a little bit about how it's a set of standardized best practices for building websites and a philosophy of design, uh, web design and development. And it goes on to say that considerations include the interoperability, accessibility, and usability of web pages. So we've heard about some of the, the really important ways that this interoperability can come into play. Uh, we're going to hear some more throughout the day. So um, we're going to hear from um, people like Andy and Michelle on CSS front. Um, another Andy, Andy's everywhere, talking about performance, uh, and Laura, uh, Laura's going to be talking about accessibility. So when we think about standards, we want to think about both the technical standards, but then also the standards that we choose to adopt. Why are they important? Well, they help us on a number of levels. So we've heard about this, uh, you know, the technical interoperability side, as in the definition, and Bruce has um, shown us some really great examples there. Um, but they do also ensure that we're all on the same page and we're speaking the same language. And we don't get frustrated uh, with misaligned expectations of one another. So as Bruce has really, really fantastically illustrated, standards are ultimately about people. This small snippet of code, which is half on the screen, uh, is a really good example of, it's a really powerful standard that you probably don't think about on a day-to-day -day basis. So on a technical level, um, this is a standard that tells a browser that the content is written in the English language. And we can get a bit more specific. So we can tell it that it is in British English. And what this does is it sort of sets the language, essentially, for all of the text on a page. But if certain parts use a different language, then we can um, add different attributes onto those elements um, so that we can identify those specifically. But why is this important? One example is styling. So for emphasis, for instance, um, with the English language, we typically use italics to denote that. 
but that may not always make a lot of sense in some different contexts. So in languages where characters um, shouldn't be skewed or instances like that, we can actually denote emphasis in other ways. So this is using um, text emphasis, um, which has got full sesame hot pink, obviously. Um, and that just kind of shows you that by changing the language attributes, you can actually um, change the style. And we can do other things there. So we can think about line breaks or hyphenation or justification. And another example of styling is with font selection. So user agents can actually use some of the language information that we provide to help select an appropriate font, which helps with the overall user experience. And what we've got here are some very subtle changes in the glyphs. Um, hopefully you can see from the code that actually all we're doing here is changing nothing but the language attribute value. Um, so we've got some different, um, different examples down there. You can play around with that if you want to. But hanging off this then, we've got styling, we've also got search and translation and spell check and accessibility tools and language specific parsing and loads of other really fabulous bits of functionality. But what these do is they rely on our browsers having a common understanding of what indicates a particular language. But more than that as well, it also relies on us having an understanding of language codes in the first instance, what they're used for, what they mean. We all know automatically, I think, looking at that, that EN denotes English. So this really tiny snippet of code actually has a much wider impact on a whole, whole set of things. And so it is with so many of our web standards. Um, so we could sum it up a little bit like this. Well, we, on the one side, we've got developers. Um, we're using tools and technologies, or frameworks, things like that, to help publish and manage content, uh, which is in the middle. On the other side, we've got users. They might have uh, you know, tools and technologies to help consume content, but also contribute back to it. And underlying that, we've got our guidelines and our specifications and our standards. So it's, it's quite a nice um, mix of an ecosystem. So it's probably not difficult to go home, get your team to start following standards that everybody considers the defaults, right? So setting the language, it's probably already baked into all of your boilerplates and generators. So it's really, really easy to get somebody to start doing this. But as we've seen, people are not necessarily always using the correct semantic elements in HTML. So it's the bits where things aren't mandatory or where we've got maybe slight variances of needs or perceived needs, um, which end up kind of influencing the standards we adopt or don't adopt. So why don't people follow standards? Well, it's usually not because they are a terrible person who thinks this. So most people don't set out to just be awful human beings. You might have seen this before. Um, so this is the, the curve of adoption for technology. And to an extent, this can actually apply. So you might see things um, like when uh, Flexbox came along and when grids come along, and you've seen certain people jump on really quickly, go, yes, I'm really excited. Not all browsers support it, but I'm going to get on board with this. Um, and then even now, there are people who don't use these types of things. So that can apply in some situations. But also, it goes a little bit further. So in my experience, you can also uh, break it down in these ways, where we've got people who don't know about certain topics. They don't know that it's a thing they should care about at all. Uh, we've got people who know that it's a thing, but maybe it just doesn't apply to them, or you know, they just don't consider it as important. So somebody might know that maybe uh, page speeds or uh, you know, page weight is a thing, um, but they just don't really care. And then we've got the people who know and care, but they can't prioritize above other things. So I'm sure we've all been there where you're really under pressure with time and you kind of cut corners and you know that you're doing it and you shouldn't, but you do it anyway. And this last point is particularly important because it's really hard to get over. And this is what I'm going to talk about quite a lot in the last section. Um, but one point before we move on that I really want to make is when you're trying to overcome these things, when you're trying to get standards adopted, you're not necessarily just speaking to other front-end people. Um, you're talking to front-end engineers, sure, but there are also back-end people who might happen to write some front-end code every now and again. Um, there might be product managers, there might be execs who need to get bought into overall concepts. There's a load of factors at play. So don't make the mistake of just thinking that these are the only people um, that you're ever going to speak to. 
Okay, so people interpret standards differently, and this is one of the, the next challenges that you're going to have to over, uh, overcome when you're trying to get people to adopt things. You might think that if something is a standard, it's really kind of clear-cut, unambiguous, set in stone. Um, not so. There is quite a lot of subjectivity still within the web space. Uh, obviously, there's an XKCD for this, because there's an XKCD for everything. Um, we do have our universal standards, so that, there's a reason why Bruce is going to Tokyo. Uh, you know, we have the W3C, we're all familiar with these the kind of things. Um, but we do sometimes end up with variants, whether they are official ones or unofficial. And we also get evolutions. This is an example that I really love. Um, these are all instances of the woman technologist emoji. Um, so we might think that we're all actually speaking the same language and complying with standards, but at the same time, we could end up with very different interpretations, um, possibly from being in different situations with different needs. Uh, if you only used a certain platform, you may not be aware that some of these ever existed, for instance. And one last pitfall. Um, so we've ended up with a sort of unofficial Japanese theme here. Uh, I love Japanese. I learn it uh, a lot. Um, Japanese has three different writing systems. You've got hiragana, katakana, and kanji, uh, which is from Chinese origins. And the top two kind of sets are reasonably limited in size. Um, but kanji is really extensive. So you need around, I think it's just over 2,000 to have a level of fluency where um, you're able to read things like newspapers and literature. Um, but in total, there are thousands and thousands, and even some native speakers don't know them all. Um, these are the ones that I know, which depressingly puts me around the level of a 10-year-old. Uh, but my point is, there are a lot. Um, and in the 1970s, one of the ministries in Japan went through this really arduous task of collecting all of the kanji so that they could generate computer fonts for them. And to do this, they needed to, um, to create standards, which led to the JS character encodings. But as we can see, now we've got the benefit of being able to type it easily today, so good job there. But after they created the standards, people noticed something a little bit strange. So with several of the characters, nobody actually knew what they meant or how they were meant to be read. Uh, they had no obvious source at all, they just appeared, and they've come to be known as Yuremoji, or ghost characters. So in 1997, an investigation was launched, and people started to put these theories together about where these characters had come from. Um, and it's basically come down to best guesses. So unfortunately, these aren't lined up properly, um, but the third one in, um, that one's made up of mountain over woman, and that in itself is perfectly valid. But we've got that line there. And what people think has happened is that somewhere along the way, when they were photocopying these characters, either kind of like a fold or things being stuck together has led to that line coming in. And this one down the bottom on the left, um, to this day, nobody really knows how that's appeared. It just happened. Um, so you can be really, really careful uh, with your standards, but you can still end up with these mistakes happening. And I love this quote, um, which is from a blog post. But the moral of the stories here is that standards aren't always perfect, and so people can really worry about whether they're adopting something with problems, and that's sometimes a fear that you need to be able to overcome. So in this last section, um, I want to talk a little bit about what we can do on a really practical level, and I'm going to share some examples of what we've been doing at Monzo, which is where I work. So for a little bit of um, context, because again, assumptions are dangerous. Um, for those of you who don't know, Monzo is um, a digital only, fully licensed bank. So we do all the banky normal things, so current accounts, savings accounts. Um, but we also have lots of nice little bits of functionality, like being able to get paid a day early, um, having bills come out of pots where you set stuff aside, and of course, liberal emoji usage. Uh, the product itself is really app-based, so when most people think of it, they probably sort of think of the, the app that lives on your phone. But we have a lot of web, actually. So we've got our marketing site and blog. Um, we've also got things like uh, Monzo Me, uh, top right there. We've got uh, the ability to pay people. Um, we've got internal tools for instance. No more avocados in the basement. Oh. Uh, we've also got um, BizOps Hub, which is where we run all of our customer support through, and there's loads of stuff going on that I also can't talk about as well. Um, we have a mission that is to make money work for everybody. And because technology can play a huge part in inclusivity, 
Um, we want to make sure that we're, we're doing that right, basically. So when I came into Monzo last December, we had lots of things that we knew could and should be better in all honesty. The reality is that in a place like Monzo, there are so many really smart people to the extent where we all have this kind of like mandatory imposter syndrome phase that we go through. Um, we have lots of people who work both across um, the front and the back end. Um, everything moves extremely fast. So we want to make sure that we've got really strong standards underpinning that. And like I say, we haven't got it right yet. Um, there's still a lot that isn't good enough, but we are working on it. Um, so here's some of the stuff that we are sort of doing and we're thinking about, and hopefully some of it might help you too. Um, this is going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but I will put the slides up tomorrow, um, after the wedding, hopefully. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Um, so, first of all, you need to think about when you're getting these blockers, um, when you're trying to change things, who are you actually trying to influence? So what, what kind of level of sphere of influence are you working on? Are you trying to make individual change, like one-to-one -one with somebody, or are you actually trying to make more systemic change, either across you know, a team or a discipline within your company, um, or actually, are you trying to go industry-wide, um, like Bruce is trying to do you know, with this new standard? You don't want to keep fixing the same problems yourself, because if you end up trying to do that, then it's the classic kind of you know, finger on the leak sort of situation where you've only got so many fingers. But also, if all you ever do is plug the leaks and try and sort of um, directly change things, then you're not directing your energy uh, elsewhere where you could be putting them. On top of that, we want to think about where the people you're trying to influence are on their journey. So do they know about these things, the people around you? Do they care? Can they prioritize? We're going to break it down into those categories. So when people don't know, it's sort of like, it's arguably the easy stuff. Um, at this point, it's about taking people from zero to one. Uh, it's kind of like you know, the ability to bring something into somebody's awareness. So generally, we're going to start with the obvious stuff. Uh, tell people, right? <laughs> this is slightly obvious. But if they don't know, you've got to let them know. Um, we had an example recently where um, one of the back-end developers actually sprung up some web stuff. Um, and I happened to see a picture of it and looked at it and saw the footer and went, that is obviously not uh, accessible in that it doesn't have sufficient color contrast. And I could just see. So I went to them and said, hey, um, I was actually on holiday. But here are some people who can help you. Here are some resources. Um, and so that's an example of how that person just didn't know. They weren't aware. But hopefully now they've learned from those resources. They've learned from the people around them. And you can do this either in person like that. You can also do it through code review. Um, one of the things we're thinking about at the moment is um, changing the PR templates. So um, we're thinking about changing that just generally for all of our web repos. But that's another opportunity to kind of like prompt people um, and give them a chance to learn about something if they didn't know about it already. Knowledge sharing is another one. Um, so it's really tiring to do a lot of this stuff alone. And you know, I'm standing up on stage today. Everybody else is sharing knowledge. And you get that multiplier effect. So, if you can start to bring people on that journey, they can help you, um, to, to, you know, to bring some of this stuff in. Um, so we do both internal knowledge sharing through things like lightning talks. We've got our all hands, which are company-wide, um, do blog posts, all the usual stuff. But also think about whether you can learn from other people. So um, we brought in people like Rachel Andrew um, to run a workshop on Grid. Um, there's courses, conferences, videos. So this is a great way of, again, kind of getting people from naught to one. Slightly scared about putting this next slide up. Uh, apologies, Bruce. We use a lot of React at Monzo. Um, but what you can do is you can start to help inform people by embedding standards into your tooling. Uh, so you've got some examples here. We've got React Axe, which is a library that basically rea uh, audits a React application, and it logs any accessibility issues to the console. And you can use things like ESLint plugins um, to flag up, again, accessibility issues. Um, so if you try and embed standards into your tooling, into your automation, into your testing, then it can, again, raise awareness of things, but it can also give people signposting and help them to understand why this is important and where they can go next. Now, we reached a sort of size and scale where we needed to make sure that our foundations were really strong. So one of the first things that I did when I came in was help um, some of the others to set up a new team, which is the web platform team, which I was just super excited about. Um, 
basically, we, we wrote a proposal, we took it to Mary, our CTO, um, and the web platform team is a really small squad, but it's got the goal of enabling all of the other web teams around the business to learn how to essentially do web at Monzo once and empower all of the people and all of the teams to do that really well. So it's a sort of like a, a hub and a catalyst to drive change, but it's not the only place. And this might be appropriate for you. So if you're getting to that point where actually um, you want to enable people, but you want a sort of like a home for some of these web standards, think about the structure in your organization and whether actually that can uh, help you do that. Now next, growing your influence and other people's. Um, this isn't necessarily about sort of influence in the, the title sense, although it can be about that, but it's more if you can become known as an X person, then people will know that if they've got a question, or if they want to learn something, they can come to you. Um, so we've got Dan in the audience. Hi, Dan, embarrassing you. Um, Dan's been doing some great work on performance lately, and so people know that he is a really good person to ask, and they can learn from him. But I'm, I'm a manager, and I'm gonna say it's also about finding opportunities for other people. So if you see somebody doing really great work in a certain area, try and promote them as well. You know, try and shout about them. Try and grow their influence for them, even if they're not doing it themselves. Next one, give it visibility. So um, these are some really great posters. Um, they're from the Home Office, and uh, there's one from Microsoft's um, inclusive design toolkit, you might want to make your own posters for standards that you care. Putting things in front of people's faces uh, means that they can't avoid it. So they may not have known about something before, but if you put up something really pretty, um, then it, you know, it catches their eye. And similarly, if you've got data, so if you are able to kind of, um, you know, hook things into your pipelines and show, say, your accessibility compliance at any one point in time, your performance, um, Make sure that that is stuff that people can actually see and it's not just hidden away somewhere. But then next we can move on to hard mode. Uh, so this is difficult. This is when people don't care. And the first thing uh, I want to say, which I think Bruce has done fantastically, is you can really appeal to people's empathy and help them relate to other people on a human level by telling stories. So we as a species, you know, we love to tell everybody stories. We love to hear stories. Um, Bruce has done things like um, showing Leonie, sort of talking through. That helps you really buy in. So you can share those stories with other people. Um, you can take them away. You can give them these kind of conference talks and go, listen to that. That was a fantastic talk. Um, what we have at work is we run everything through Slack, and we have an accessibility channel. Um, and this is just an example that I thought was really, really nice. Um, so we share stories of times when we've made a difference. This is actually the, the paid early um, animation where you can sort of you activate it by dragging the money into your wallet. Uh, I stole that from Sophie's Twitter, sorry Sophie. Um, but this is the feedback that we got and it shows that it actually makes a difference to somebody's life. And similarly, uh, we published our TV ads a while ago and somebody came up on Twitter and said, but they're not subtitled. And so this is kind of what happened in the public eye this is what happened on the back end. So we had um, one of the, the Monzonauts saying, can, you, can we add captions? And then we had a uh, description. And there's a bonus. You get the auto-generated captions coming up. Um, and the tagline was, you make Monzo Monzo, which came up as, you make mom's old monster for some reason. So <laughs> this in itself is a story. You know, it gets people talking about it. It gets people kind of caring and, and laughing about it. And it brings them along on that journey. Sometimes I think we have that habit of going, well, you know, if it's documented, if there are standards, then, you know, that's fine. That's all done. And um, this is a bit of an anti-pattern. Don't overly rely on documentation when you're trying to get something adopted because the documentation can act as a way of helping people remember the stories and helping people remember the key points and being referenced. But it doesn't do a great job of telling them directly. So make sure that you're not kind of, um, you know, leaning on that too much. As a manager... Um, this is meant to say career, by the way. As a manager, we uh, really want to think about people's careers. We want to think about helping them understand where they want to go. This is something that's quite new to me. Um, but recently, one of my colleagues, Gwen Diagram, um, introduced to us this wheel of testing, which is a tool, and um, you probably won't be able to see, but it basically outlines a lot of the different angles um, that you can consider with testing. And so what we're thinking about at the moment is a wheel of development to have career conversations with people 
And we want to make sure that standards are actually built into that so that people can understand what does it mean if I want to become an expert in accessibility or performance? So what are the aspects that I should be learning about? So try and think about how you can have those kind of conversations as well. Next one, if you actually build a culture around something, and if you have a diverse culture as well, then hopefully you can get to the point with different aspects where people can feed in with their experiences, but ultimately, uh, if you get to the point where everybody cares, then ultimately, people who don't care will be the odd one out, and that sounds a bit cruel, um, but it can be really successful, um, and it can actually mean that everybody does genuinely buy into something. But if that seems cruel, it's probably not as cruel as the next one, which is forcing people to care. Uh, so this, uh, you won't probably be able to see again. Uh, this is our progression framework, which you can find at progression.monzo.com. We are redoing this quite fundamentally at the moment, and hopefully I'm going to be able to share a bit more about that. It's something I'm working on at the moment. Um, but recently, I made a call to make some changes to it, because I think it's important. So this is level one, which is people right at the start of their um, development career. And um, we previously had, under mastery, learns to write HTML and CSS following guidance. And so we've changed that to be learns to write semantic HTML. And then you can go up the levels. So level two, these are new behaviors that we've added in. So we expect web engineers to be thinking about this kind of stuff. This is how they progress now. Uh, level three is when um, people are kind of like a, a sort of, um, they're independent. They're what we'd expect uh, people to get to at some point in their career. So at this point, it becomes less about demonstrating they can do something, and more about how they can start to promote these kind of behaviors to others. And level four is when somebody becomes senior, and at this point, we expect them to sort of start feeding back in, so learning from the outside world um, and bringing that back into the culture. So you can force people in kind of sort of nice ways. And then finally, when people can't prioritize, and this is kind of the, the expert mode, right? Um, the most successful way I think you can do this is to appeal with logic and data and really understand what matters to people. So Bruce, at the end of his talk, had some fantastic examples. If you care about money, if you care about uh, you know, doing good in the world, there are different angles that you can actually explain why using semantics and why using accessibility um, and so all of these other kind of principles can be really, really important on a business level. So for us, as I've mentioned, it's sort of the right thing to do because we do want to make money work for everybody and the wrong approach to technology can exclude people. So that's kind of, it's a bit of an easier sell for me to try and bring some of these things in because it is part of our company mission. Um, but also, as a bank, our risk appetite is extremely low. So if you can also talk about uh, you know, maintenance and uh, having this sort of future-friendly approach and trying to think about making better things for everybody, then you can also get by in, in that respect. So try and think about what actually appeals to the people that might be blocking you. And that could be threats, almost. Not direct threats, not you know, horrible threats. Um, but in the States, we've seen lawsuits recently. Uh, there's one against Beyonce. Um, there's been some quite high-profile case uh, some sort of stories around Domino's Pizza, who basically would rather fight in court than actually just fix the problems. Um, but there can be all sorts of sort of scare stories that you can use. So you can talk about how it's going to be harder for us to hire staff or good staff if we don't follow standards. There can be legal risk and compliance. There can be um, audits that you get third parties to come in and say, look, this is all really terrible. It should be better. So there's different ways that you can do that. And finally, I wanted to put this in because I think this is something that actually a lot of people just resort to. So if this is something that's important to you, if you really want to push some kind of a standard through, you may just decide to do it anyway. And I'm lucky in that Monzo gives us a lot of autonomy, which you can probably tell from the fact that I was setting up a new team uh, in my probation. Um, but if this is where you end up, and this, this is what you decide to do, then my top tips are one, State your intent, and I think this is something that's been talked about a lot more lately. Um, I first saw it when I was doing some work with the Open Data Institute, and they had it on a big uh, screen. So don't seek permission or uh, seek forgiveness. State your intent, because that allows for comment, but it just shows your, your sort of direction of travel. 
Next, use your platform for good. So I'm very privileged in that I'm part of leadership teams. Um, I'm responsible for certain you know, aspects of engineering within the business. But if you are in a leadership position, consider your stance because actually you can use your platform um, as, a, as, a, as a force for good because if you choose to build a culture around standards and if you set that out and you want to follow, um, then that can be really powerful. But likewise, if you sort of make it clear that you don't care that is a very powerful statement in itself as well. So be careful of um, you know, what you are setting out. I think the other key thing here is if you are using your platform, um, it still really, really matters to bring people along on that journey with you. You've got to empower others. Don't forget, you don't want to be stuck there with your, your hands on the leaks yourself. And focus. So don't try to do everything at once. You are probably going to come away from today. You're probably generally just fizzing around with all these ideas about things that could be better. You want to you know, overhaul everything, put grid into place. You want to uh, make sure that everything's fully accessible. You want to you know, just make sure it's as performant as possible. But start with one thing and do it really well, because that will earn you trust, and it will earn you respect, and it will give you some visibility to some extent. And it will set you up really well to start doing the next thing. Um, but hopefully that next time, the road won't be quite so rocky. for you. So thank you very much. Uh, if you've got any questions, give me a shout. I'm going to be running away quite soon. Uh, if anybody wants any stickers, Sam Jones at the back has some. Uh, so thanks. That's been a really lovely to speak to you.